Uh, I'll just jump right in. Um, so my talk today is concerned with two historically situated print forms, the Enlightenment Encyclopedia and the Romantic Periodical. So rather than speaking of these forms in their totality, I'm interested specifically in how they produce or can be under understood by a theory of the index. I will say more about what these theories entail, but first I want to give some sense of my overall project and where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm in the very, very early stages of a, a dissertation that will begin from the premise that the book index necessitates a theory of the indexical signifier, which I think is a very useful tool for thinking about a concept like structure in relation to textuality. Um, I'm still figuring a lot of these things out, but this talk is like a, a first step or a thinking through of something like a chapter that will be like how these problems relate to uh, like book history and print culture. Um, so in a sense, uh, thinking of the index or the periodical qua index provides insight into their media effects, uh, which are different from one another, but similar insofar as they provide an outlet for structuring or ordering. Um, okay, so the term index is used in different ways. We have the semiotic sense of an indexical sign, the bibliographic sense of a bookend compendium to facilitate the searching of a text, the scientific sense of a scale or register of some quantitative value, such as a cost of living index, or even looser definitions related to connectivity or linking in the way that texts are interanimated by one another. I found that it's been productive to think of these, uh, the ways these different texts bear on one another, but my thought is always uh, come back to the primacy of the semiotic. Here I generally follow Charles Sanders Peirce's definition of a sign that has an existential connection to its object, and often take up his examples of a footprint, a weather vane, a photograph, and uh, shifters or diaxis, words that require contextual info, such as this, now, I, here. In his Algebra of Logic, Peirce states that, quote, the index asserts nothing. It only says there. It takes hold of our eyes, as it were, and forcibly directs them to a particular object, and there it stops. Much concern has been raised about the status of representation after the advent of, the digi of digital media, and the concerns, uh, these concerns often involve an sensible loss or death of the index occasioned by the mutability of code or the distance from the referential ground we might find in something like the chemistry of a photograph. I become skeptical when these arguments are articulated in semiotic terms, so they often, I find, often will reduce the index of a signifier to physical trace or touch, rather than in the full range of logical or referential senses elaborated by Peirce. It's not that I think casting doubt on the evidentiary function of the photograph uh, is illegitimate, but that this idea is structured by um, its medium specificity, uh, without which it finds a different articulation. Um, my question essentially is whether this uh, much talked about death or promise of the index, depending on the argument, applies to other media, uh, particularly text. So without going too deep into stuff about the digital, I'd like to turn to an earlier moment in which a historical break was seen as occasioned, at least partly by media shift, the end of the Enlightenment and the beginning of the Romantic period. The late 18th and early 19th centuries are marked by a dramatic expansion in the number of books, as well as the social spaces and practices centered around this emergent economy. It's important to note that while printed objects become more diverse, the shift in the media landscape is not occasioned by new physical forms, but rather a heightening and saturation of given ones. The technological innovations taking place, continuous paper makers, steam-powered printers, rail distribution, primarily serve to enhance the scale and speed of production. Uh, my purpose is not to contest the view that a radical shift in theories of representation happen in this, this time, but that the index, insofar as it provides a structure of similarity and equivalence, appears to resist the shift by maintaining and conserving the text. It asserts, quite simply, what is there. Less simply, though, is, is that this there is occasioned by the contextual information of the searcher. The answer in Kant's 1784 essay, an answer to the question, what is enlightenment, involves the emergence of a self that can, be, that can break free from man's self-incurred immaturity with respect to understanding. In a basic sense, this involves simply thinking for oneself and relying on one's own knowledge and experience in determining how to act. Well, that may sound straightforward. This essay seeks its implications for, uh, Kant's essay seeks its implications for a complex series of philosophical and historical operations, which subsequently sparked an ongoing debate in the German periodical press. 
Writing in the Berlinisch Monatschrift, the theologian Johann Zollner poses the eponymous question in an article about civil marriage ceremonies, and Kant responds in the pages of the same periodical. He identifies three figures as enemies of the Enlightenment, the pastor, the doctor, and the book, who he carefully depicts as standing in for knowledge of the unenlightened. Quote, if I have a book that has understanding for me, a pastor who has a conscience for me, a doctor who judges my diet for me, and so forth, surely I do not need to trouble myself. Kant's concern that is in, in encountering these figures, humans are divested of their rational capacities. Brad Pasenek and Chad Wellman's article, The Enlightenment Index, in, imagines a bibliographic scene that can account for Kant's concern. By focusing on the index, with which the authors define as an incre increasingly interrelated web of citations and links, instead of the narrow definition of an alphabetical guide to the contents of a single text, the article attempts to show how print forms and technologies mediated by excess, disorder, network, and cross-reference generate Kant's concern that authority has been ceded to the book. This media environment, which is historical, is then subsequently used as evidence for claims about periodizing the Enlightenment against the Romantic. Uh, arguments about this particular period shift are often predicated on the emergence of the print economy. Uh, reference materials and encyclopedias, which previously sought to describe nature, began to replicate it. Here one could evoke the way that Carl Linnaeus's taxonomy begins to include the system of literaria, which in later editions subjects printing techniques to the same nomenclature as biology, or the many poetic references punning on leaves. The awareness of information o overload already realized in the Renaissance is uh, intensified in the Enlightenment. And authors of the Enlightenment Index provide ample ed evidence ranging from specific techniques such as headwords, prefaces, footnotes, and of course, actual indexes to more generic forms such as taxonomies, encyclopedias, and dictionaries. The key Enlightenment Index texts are compiled from uh, across national boundaries and decades, ranging from the early scholarly review journals Acta Eruditorum, Philosophical Transactions, and the Journal de Savant in the 1670s, up to the two-volume index accompanying Diderot and D'Alembert's Encyclopédie in 1780. For Passanek and Wellman, uh, the Enlightenment was predicated on indexicality as a condition of possibility. And here, indexicality is thought of less in the terms of a semiotic category, but rather a media environment in which printed objects be assume a comprehensive, autonomous structure. But if the Enlightenment index is to be envisioned as a structure of print, there's something a bit too open-ended about Passanek and Wellman's definition in situating the index along distributed media concepts like environment, network, and web, we lose something as, of its function as a definite, bounded, semiotic operation. This is why I like to route my reading of historical print forms through Peirce's notion of indexicality as a logical relation. It's a relation that is easily evoked by these handy book and compendiums we call indexes, but other categorically similar taxonomizing and organizing texts um, as well. Uh, they're potentially limitless because we can always produce new readings, uh, new ways of deeming something relevant, uh, but they are also bounded because they must always meaningfully relate to the text. Now, though indexing involves the determination of content, which we often think of as altogether separate from structure or form, the act of reading or writing them is a process whereby we can think the tensions between the inside-outside or the movement or stasis of a text. The question of whether there's an epistemological difference between knowledge gained from acquaintance and knowledge gained from reference is a prominent theme in 18th century literature. A quick survey, then. Jonathan Swift's Tale of the Tub, 1704, mocks lords who merely acquaint themselves with the titles of the books in their libraries, which is then compared with the uh, admittedly, quote, uh, choicer, profounder, and politer method of getting a thorough insight into the index by which the whole book is governed and turned like fishes by the tail, end quote. This metaphor is borrowed by Alexander Pope in the Dunciad, 1728, quote, for index learning turns no student pale, yet holds the eel of science by the tail. Um, end quote. A similar concern is addressed by Samuel Johnson when he states, Knowledge is of two kinds. We know a subject ourselves, or we know where we can find information upon it. Uh, if these 
examples seem historically distant from Kant's line of inquiry in 1784, it's because I hope to convey how establishing the criteria for historical periodization on these grounds must necessarily pull from a range of, of temporal and national contexts. Um, so Ephraim Chambers' Cyclopedia, or a Universal Dictionary of the Arts and Sciences, uh, first published in 1728, is one of the more uh, early influential uh, English encyclopedias. Um, Third Chambers is working from uh, within a tradition of arts and science dictionaries. He differentiates himself from earlier reference works by providing what he calls structure uh, through the systematic use of cross-references. Uh, so this uh, is the quote on the handout. Former lexicographers have not attempted anything like structure in their works, or seem to have been aware that a dictionary was in some measure capable of the advantages of a continued discourse. Accordingly, we see nothing like a whole in what they have done, and hence, such materials as they did afford for the present work generally need further preparation, ere they become fit for our purpose, which was as different from theirs as a system from a cento. Chambers' aim in this preface is uh, to dispel the reader's suspicion that a single work, quote, so disproportionate to a single person's experience, end quote, could be the product of sole authorship. Uh, Chambers admits he borrows materials from previous works and credits the time and efforts of the many authors of Renaissance dictionaries and vocabularies. Chambers' innovation, then, is at the level of form rather than content. He doesn't purport to offer new knowledge, but rather how it is ordered, providing structure to a distributed network of increasingly numerous and specialized books. He claims uh, to structure the realm of knowledge itself. In creating a whole out of disparate parts, one is able to see the whole and thus navigate it properly. Chambers sees alphabetical order as existing apart from nature, but is necessary for the navigability of information. Um, it is within this order that his structuring principle emerges. It's another quote. By course of references, from generals to particulars, from premises to conclusions, from cause to effect, and vice versa, i.e. in one word, from more or less to complex and less to more. A communication is open between the several parts of the work and the several articles are in some measure re uh, replaced in their order of science, out of which the technical or alphabetical that wants to remove them. Cross-reference thus reintegrates the object of the encyclopedia into what he calls the natural order of science from its disintegration via the, techno the technical apparatus. It allows, us, uh, for, it allows for a subject to follow a train of thought to learn and investigate in their own course. I find Chambers' preface to be inordinately provocative. Uh, in it, we find the enlightenment ideal of grasping the totality of knowledge as a whole to be facilitated by its structure, which he seems to be impl uh, imply is made possible by the connectivity implied when a word stands in for understanding. Structure as a means of seeing the whole is consistent in evoke, consistently evoked in terms of visuality. The constituent parts of knowledge are represented as a view, and when encountering a cross-reference, we are told to see another entry. It might also be interesting to speculate on how this example uh, relates to um, structure's supposed uh, historical latency that we've been talking about. The word seems to be employed theoretically, but not, is not yet articulated as such especially since in his own taxonomy, the entry for structure only tells us to see entry for building. Which <laughs> um, in turn elaborates on some practical concerns of architecture. Um, returning to Kant's concerns, uh, the paradox is that these assertions of the priority of knowledge by acquaintance of the individual against the book, of the value of unmediated creativity, are precisely those that come to define the romantic author. The period that is defined by the rule is superseded by exception in the next. Passanek and Wellman are aware of this. There's a quote from their article. Even as the romantic author attempts to denaturalize and discipline print, he inadvertently adds to it. Early in the 18th century, the bibliographic sphere was recognized as an objective material realm with its own internal logic and organization. But in the inundated final decades of the century, book plagues and floods figured second order of nature as a threat to human agency, one that might obscure nature, obviate the cognizing subject, and become impervious to all human interventions. So, the, the evolution of print is genealo genealogical. While mutation, aligned with individuation, directs the evolution, its forms have antecedents. While periodization helps us make sense of this development, 
it's far more complicated the other way around, i.e., where the development of print helps us understand period. One of Kant's principal concerns in an answer uh, is to de determine whether the age in which he lives can be characterized by a process of individuation. In doing so, he offers a qualification. Quote, if it is now asked whether we at present live in an enlightened age, the answer is no, but we do live in an age of enlightenment. Quote. This shift from an adjectival description of the age as a whole to a noun as a single property marks enlightenment as an emergent phenomenon. While Kant is concerned with his own time, he sees enlightenment as a process that has to be repeatedly taken up because it relies to a great uh, extent on intellectual sovereignty. It becomes complicated at the level of the public as opposed to the individual. Kant thus identifies several of the internal contradictions involved in arriving at claims at historical period through a philosophical concept. What is true of certain individuals may not be sufficient to characterize a population, and what is true of one time may change in another, even in respect to, every, to the very criteria necess necessary for questioning itself. The tension between establishing principles and reason and the evolution of clerical, medical, and political procedures is central uh, to his essay, which can be located in his repeated reference to future generations. Quote, one, one age cannot enter into an alliance with, on oath to put the next age in a position where it would be impossible for it to extend and correct its knowledge or to make any progress whatsoever in enlightenment. What he is speaking of here is the possibility of a clergy to set forth an unalterable set of doctrines, but it speaks to the problem of transferring the values of one age to the next. But I want to call attention to the way that in offering a structure of equivalence in asserting nothing, indexes appear to keep the past with us or referred across cultures, it is important to know that this is only appearance. Before venturing further, I want to heed a word of caution via Michel Foucault, who explains how the level of order which appears to reference, uh, to refer to a historical text in its own term, is itself an ordering that can be historicized. Um, this is Foucault. The ever more complete preservation of what was written, the establishment of archives, then of filing systems for them, the reorganization of libraries, the drawing up of catalogs, indexes, and inventories, all these things represent, at the end of the classical age, not so much a new sensitivity to time, to its past, to the density of history, as a way of introducing into the language already imprinted on things, and into the, the traces it has left, an order of the same type as that which was being established between living creatures. This is why I remain transparent about um, how my turn to the Enlightenment Encyclopedia in terms of mediation says less about uh, the form and its historicity proper, but how I find we are still haunted by it today. The concept of mediation is related to concepts of communication and transmission, but with explicit attention to material objects, like books. This attention to material forms might occasion a reading of Kant's enlightenment as a historical rather than a philosophical category, because mediations can be more easily pinned down to specific times and places than the movement of understanding. However, this, this quantity, which is the condition of, con of uh, enlightenment's possibility, also entails its closure, uh, because the moment that Kant identifies it, it ends. Uh, Clifford Siskin argues that the end of the Enlightenment period was the result of an internal contradiction. Quote, Enlightenment can be understood not as failed or interrupted by revolution or romanticism, but it contained the formal conditions of its own demise. In a strange way, it succeeded in ending itself. Quote. Siskin also argues that the irony of Kant naming the period, uh, naming his period the Age of Enlightenment is that he makes it precisely at the moment it comes to mark the start of another age, the period we call the Romantic. In identifying it uh, precisely according to the scale of period time um, at the moment it comes to pass, Kant's certainty about his own age reveals something about the slipperiness of the period shift occurring at the end of the 18th century. Kant's vision entails a progression that enlightenment will lead to further stages of intellectual development. However, the development that actually occurs is identified in Romanticism as turning from the past and seeking a claim in the new spirit of the age. For other intellectual historians, the place to evaluate the shift is embedded in the material world, objects, tools, and yes, books. Specifically, it is writing, as well as accompanying forms in reading and print that is best suited for this evaluation because it, becomes, it occupies the mediating ground between material and understanding. Siskin will go to define two senses of enlightenment, 
uh, the differentiation or apperception of which can be thought in terms of writing. That's how enlightenment, in its most capacious sense, as, uh, as the condition of modernity materialized. That enlightenment is the, is the travel narrative we tell when the technology of writing takes the form of embedded systems. Siskin, sorry. Um, system is an important conceptual category for Siskin because he explains the difference between enlightenments and subsequently how romanticism overwrites this difference. Um, he refers to Ernst Cassier's use of esprit systematique uh, to argue that the aspiration to comprehensively document and organize all knowledge epitomizes the enlightenment spirit. What traditional accounts of romanticism that emphasize genius, originality, and imagination overlook the continuation of systematic, systematizing knowledge production in the early 19th century. Because the histor historicization of romanticism is so closely aligned with the literary, a category like system, which Siskin labels a genre, helps the periodizing historian look at writing beyond the specific qualities of individual authors and incorporate a broader array of media, such as reading audiences, publishing capital, legal requirements, and paratextual info. Systematicity can then, be think, can then become a way of thinking the romantic period in light of a complicated periodization. Its apparent incompatibility with uh, romantic literary tropes, nature, fragment, lyric, etc., is telling it. Not only because the incompatibility doesn't hold up to this scrutiny, but because it reveals an, an inadequate engagement with the conditions in which these tropes are produced. These conditions might include the beginning of arts and science institutions, the development of a middle class reading audiences through the dissemination of periodicals, and a new political and geographical awareness. Siskin defines romanticism not in opposition to enlightenment, but to a difference in the scale and orientation of how knowledge is acquired and put to use. Romanticism, he writes, far from being the nightmare turn from the dream of enlightenment knowledge, is the moment in which the reorganization of that knowledge leads to unprecedented productivity. While German periodicals have been offering indexes since the 1670s, it is in December 1755 in England that periodicals begin to advertise on this basis, as well as offering review summaries and extensively indexing remarkable passages within the articles. This form continues well into the 19th century and through the rise of British periodical magazines like Blackwood's, the Edinburgh Review, and the Quarterly Review, all of which include detailed index entries, which are located at the end of each volume, uh, extending anywhere between two to six separate issues and paginated sequentially. Um, uh, so these integrate the, the knowledge that can be obtained by the object into its feature of its marketability. It goes without saying that indexes facilitate information retrieval, the usefulness of which is activated at the moment of reading. There seems to be a built-in assumption about the storage capacity of print. Content lays dormant until it is needed and may continue lest it be made accessible. In William Hazlitt's On Periodical Criticism, published in the May 1823 Edinburgh Review, he laments what he sees as the corrupting forces of political and commercial motives in the periodical press. His initial question is whether there is anything comparable in his time to historical occasions of genius. And he ultimately argues that his age is not conducive to genius because uh, of the effects generated by periodicals, such as dispersed authorship and the integration of art artistic disciplines, which among all other things is a result of market forces. The possible irony, of course, is that he <coughs> participates in the very thing he critiques. Or for Hazlitt, this isn't a contradiction because the function of the periodical is anything but homogenous. In terms suggestive of the organicism of a self-replicating system, quote, periodical criticism is favorable to periodical criticism. It contributes to its own improvement, and its cultivation proves not only that it suits the spirit of the times, but advances it. It certainly never flourished more than at present. Here, the decentralized polysemous proliferation of the periodical can be brought into univocality through its function as a commodity. Despite Hazlitt's reservations about the commercial culture, this orientation of the literary sphere towards a mass audience advances the spirit of the age and yet impedes genius. A passage decrying the integration of diverse subject matter might give us a clue into why indexes become necessary to the production and advertising of periodicals. It's from Hazlitt, uh, the quote on the thing. 
Uh, the fine arts, by their spread, interfere with one another and hinder the growth of originality. All the greatest things are done by the division of labor, by the intense concentration of a number of minds, each on a single and chosen subject. But by the progress of cultivation, different arts and exercises stretch out their arms to impede, not to assist one another. Politics blend with poetry, painting with literature, fashion and elegance must be combined with learning and study, and thus the mind gets a smattering of everything and a mastery in none. The progression of the arts is impeded by their intersection with other disciplines, subjects, and discourses. The periodical is representative of this problem because, of course, it caters to a range of interests. Articles about poetry are offered alongside travel narratives. Questions of foreign policy are juxtaposed with lists of local bankruptcies, etc. The index is more than a pragmatic time-saving tool. It is a necessary response to the dispersion of printed subject matter. But it's not merely reactive either. It participates in the construction of a reader who, in engaging with the literary marketplace, must flip between articles with ease, a uh, topic as the median variable between the timelessness of the literary and the immediacy of the present. John Clanchard identifies a single year as a turning point in the transformation of reading audiences following the periodical. Uh, quote, the, the 12 months between November 1816 and October 1817 crystallized the tension between modes of reading prefigured in the 1790s. He writes, some key texts from this year can represent this crystallization. Uh, a number from, from Coleridge, the Statesman's Manual, Lacerman, and the Biographica Literaria, as well as like Coleridge also attempts uh, an encyclopedia in this year, uh, which sought to uh, relieve the organization of knowledge from what he saw as the artificiality or of alphabetization. So instead of organizing articles uh, on the arts and sciences, uh, by, by alphabet, he, he organizes them by in the order he thinks that they should be read. Um, obviously, this practice uh, did not catch on. Uh, so, uh, within this milieu, Coleridge identifies what he considers the death of self publishing. Um, but Clancher points out that the middle class cultural critic mistakes for a historical end, the loss of the periodical <laughs> essay, what is in fact a shift in cultural practice from one social class to another. Here we might, uh, here what might seem like an inverse relation to the historical situation of Kant's enlightenment, if one permits a comparison. Uh, the historical rupture defined by an individual stake in intellectual sovereignty in one period is followed by the necessitation of the institution in the next. We might say that that which seems like a rupture is actually a gradual process of the middle class coming to terms with its mediation. Clancher also touches on the heteroglossic effect of collaborative authorship. The, the monthly and quarterly journals had begun to absorb the writers uh, into the discursive mode of each journal, often merging writer, editor, and publisher into a corporate collective author, institutionally set apart from its readers. But here, a gap between the collective author and the imagined reading public is inscribed. Clancher realizes the interests of the periodical writer cannot be mapped with precision onto those of the reading public. This setting apart poses a methodological problem for the history of reading audiences because, unfortunately, they are silent. Instead, we have to work inferentially from how an audience is imagined and constructed within a given periodical. I propose that indexes are particularly rich in this respect because every entry is predicated on an assumption about what aspects of a text that readers will find useful or attractive. Contemporary indexes tend to revert to easily identify identifiable entries, such as titles, authors, and locations. Uh, this is not so of romantic periodicals, which often include detailed index entries at the higher levels of abstraction, such as concepts, institutions, genres, uh, each of which might include several subheadings. In order to get a better sense of how indexes construct a reader, uh, albeit a reader who must navigate a saturated marketplace of text, it is important to look not only in, at the search terms under which a text is included, but what, is what it is next to and what it must differentiate itself from. The article on the analogy between the growth of individual and national genius, which is uh, not attributed to any single author, uh, from the January 1820 issue of Bikewoods, describes the intersection of the experience between the individual and the nation. Uh, Clancher described this as a homology created by the feedback loop of indiv individual and collective writing. Quote, the individual reader experiences his own mental power in the act of reading such texts that may also lead him to generalize such powers to 
to those of the nation in which he participates as a reader, as a member of a certain audience. So this article, for instance, asks how an empirical individual's ultimate form of self, uh, genius, can both form the model and the foundation of uh, realizing a greater collective self. In what amounts to a newfound capacity to play with the interaction of form and content, the imagined middle class reader is given a sense of this mental activity by approximating its movements. And so, banalic, an activity like searching for a text is given new weight. The index entries for this article are relatively standard. Uh, there are no interpretive claims about its use. It is only permitted uh, entries by title and initial page. However, it appears five times under analogy, national, genius, individual, and remarks, uh, two of which contain cross-references. So in way of closing then, uh, I'd like to offer a short reading of these entries which contain cross-references to demonstrate how this type of reading might be generative. And uh, I'm not exactly sure how to, how to read this, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, under national, we have monument on the proposal to take the Parthenon as the model of and individual genius, analogy between the growth of debt, remarks on Heathfield's plan for the reduction of, under genius, individual and national, on the analogy between the growth of, on the diversity of, examples of, from living authors. So within the logic of the index, those interested in searching for the individual and those searching for the nation are quite literally brought to the same source. Taking the entry for nation as a starting place, the reader can choose between and subsequently individuate oneself from a uh, presumably positive article on monuments or a presumably critical article on debt. With the entry on genius, one is made aware of and subsequently recommended to emulate diverse instances of real life people. So lots of like potential problems uh, here, but it's like it's kind of like interesting uh, just the way that this, this sort of works. Um, uh, what I hope to have outlined is how we can observe the internal structure through which print forms gives a picture of media environments made possible by the supposition of historicity. This does not claim to represent period as comprehensive, yet none, nonetheless provides modes of reading uh, identity and difference. Uh,